Hey kids, it's time to get some SML podcast all up in that. What's up, everybody? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. We are starting off the show with a party cast. No Cole yet. Might be here later on in the show, I think. Uh, but Tim's here. Pernell's here. Chris is here. How's everybody doing? We're all fucking exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. me I'm well most. rested. And no, I'm just kidding. This is the most. I won't say I'm exhausted, but I am surprisingly tired. I worked. I did like a full double shift today and then went to the gym and then tried to cook dinner. And now I'm drinking Yerbe. So it's like, yeah. This Ooh, is- Yerbe is great. Are you familiar with that stuff? Yes, I love it. And it's buy one, get one at Wawa right now. So every day I go there and buy like 15 cans. Or oh, 16. my God. Are you, yeah, you drinking like the chilled kind, like the Yerba Mate or whatever? Yeah, it's a specific beverage that uses Yerba Mate. Um, oh, yeah, Yerbe with, with the E, right? Yeah. Yerbe. <laughs> yeah, that's what I call it, too. Like, this is my <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a delightful one. I like the uh, Goyaki or whatever it's called, the yellow can. Oh, oh, see, I oh, was that one, but now I need to look into it. Oh, it's good. It's, I haven't it's very, had any of what you guys are talking about. I don't it, even know what it is. It's like super caffeinated tea. Mm. So they make that's, these really smooth energy drinks out of it that aren't as sugary, and they're they're delicious though. Exactly, and that's what I like about them. It's like. Like it's like on one hand, like, a part, like basically, if you're like big on like heavy sodas and such, you might drink a yerba and go, "Oh God, this isn't sweet enough," or it has this weird tartness to it. But if you're in my case, where it's like I drink soda, but I don't drink it often enough that the I've lost a bit of the hit for the heavy sweetness of soda. This stuff ends up working just fine. It's like all right, it's, it's doing the trick. Though the dangerous part is I've recommended it to people in the past, and then they go out buy it because, like, Pernell likes it, and they go, what the fuck, man? Why'd you give me this nasty <laughs> ass drink? So I'm like, uh-huh. hey, just because I like it doesn't mean I said you will. I just know what I like to drink. So, but the people were getting pissed about me for over- I'm suggesting this, or just saying I drink it. They're you asking know? for your opinion. That doesn't make it a good opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we're going to review some games. <laughs> what? <laughs> At some point. But my opinion is smashing. If people just suck at drinking beverages, that's that's on them. I said I wouldn't go that far. Everybody likes different stuff. But, I mean, I always try to preface my thoughts with, well, I like it. You might not if or you might not in this situation. So if they're like hearing that and go, I'm going to buy this drink, knowing that they like sugary shit. And they go, oh, this is nasty. Why would you recommend it to me? It's like, because you can't hear. <laughs> well, the, the kind I just mentioned, the yellow yellow can kind is actually pretty sweet it's not it's like on the level of like one of those sports hydration drinks that people actually aren't supposed to drink but they do anyway because they're like it's like water <laughs> but it's actually God. like 30 grams of sugar <laughs> that's definitely gatorade for you yeah it's it's like that not as sweet as soda but it is you know it it's sufficiently treat treat like mm, treat yeah. like yeah yeah it, it's sh- when you drink it, it's not like not like coffee where you're just like, I'm just doing this for the caffeine. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you actually are like, oh, this just is doing this for my fix. Mm-hmm. I enjoy the beverage, too. Yeah, your bay yeah. is good, too. It's it is a little more on the um on the like unsweetened side, though, for sure. Yes, yes. And like, honestly, I'm the type of person also where it's like, I'm not much for only drinking it for X anymore. Like, I feel like there's enough out there that short of like genuine desperation in a situation, I'm not going to put myself through that. I want to drink what I like. And Yerbe is it. And I got to know now, like, Tim, what are you drinking these days? Water. (laughs) (laughs) Why do you drink that nasty shit? I'm kidding. (laughs) So I asked pretty much it. Oh, go ahead. Water, a little bit of milk here and there, and uh, that's about it. That's me. As far as beverage consumption goes, I don't do a lot of, uh, yeah, very boring. Hey, but at the same time, I mean, your bladder and your kidneys, thank you. I mean, I drink a (laughs) lot of water, so. 
Well, I mean, that means you just got like freaking like veiny The bladder muscle. gets plenty bladder. of work. <laughs> <laughs> Your bladder can bench press a Buick. <laughs> Never put it to the task, but. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Come on, do it. It's show exclusive. Oh. <laughs> Patreon content. <laughs> you have Patreon content. I need to Oh my god, that poor child is stuck beneath that Buick. Oh wow. There's there's timing. <laughs> Let me chug some water. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> my moment has arrived. <laughs> Ecubus smash with bladder. <laughs> and then, then Joe and Jay, you're still on the Mountain Dew kick, right? You said you you imported that one dew, you said. Yeah, I I had a Supernova, and then I also had a Passion Fruit Frenzy one, which that one was really sweet to start, and then by the end of the can, it was really sour. It was interesting. I had me on the sad tip, though, at one because I was all excited. He sent me a photo. He's like, check out these Mountain Dews. I'm like, oh, shit, Nova's back. And he's like, actually. <laughs> hate to break it to you, but this is an import from fucking Finland, because I have nothing else better to do with my life. And, and import a bottle of soda from fucking Finland. <laughs> hey, I can't knock that, man. I'm drink I'm eating freaking or not eating, but preparing to eat those freaking uh turkey dinner candy corn. So we all have our things. <sighs> turkey dinner candy corn? Yes. It's like I'm continuing the Jones's soda tradition now in candy corn form. Oh, I don't know. You never was brave enough to drink those um, Jones sodas. I did all of them. I did the turkey wow. twice and the Christmas dinner one at least once. They were all disgusting. Let's just get that out of the way. Except for the dessert ones, which are kind of hilarious. It's almost like you just put them in there so you can wash your mouth out with it or when you're done dying. Why? Uh, I'll let <laughs> they exist, man. It's, the <laughs> oh, it's excitement. Some people go and, you know, hunt exotic animals. Some people go on crazy Tibetan adventures. I <laughs> turkey flavored soda. I mean, it's just my thing. <laughs> I know the only, you know, the only flavor I ever really wanted them to come out with was Dr. Pepper flavored. <laughs> Dr. Pepper flavored Jones's soda. Yeah. <laughs> and they like, call it by brand name. <laughs> <laughs> Pepper flavored soda. <laughs> I. I don't even know how I'd feel if I saw it. It's not Dr. Pepper. It's Dr. Pepper flavored. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's still Joan Soda, so don't worry. You're still cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're still trendy. <laughs> I don't know about trendy, though, because, like, it was – Joan Soda was cool in the, like, mid-90s, like, as far as when I was growing up. You take that back. It never stopped being cool. I, I mean, it just stopped being available wherever I was, so I, did, I thought it went away, and then I moved to Austin, and like, oh, there it is. It's in the in the expensive stores. It shocked me. Like, I went to Florida, like, last summer, and found it at a 7-Eleven and lost my shit, because <laughs> I used to be obsessed with the stuff. I would buy it from, like, Panera Bread, that <clears throat> peach, peach de mode or whatever, and it was... Oh, it's the shit. Brunel's looking for all the fucking endorsement deals tonight. He's name dropping <laughs> Jones Soda. He's name dropping Panera Bread. Oh, man. And the candy corn brand, Brock's. Brock's? <laughs> Brock's bread. I hope, that, I hope that Panera Bread sends us all like a loaf of sourdough or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just a loaf in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Not even in a box. I send people loaves in the mail, but usually I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a poop joke. But I used to get ecstatic for that shit. Like I, that's why I had trouble giving up sugary stuff. I need to get back on that kick again. And I think about it. But back when I like really was awful, like sweet stuff, no candies, no nothing. What would always pull me the hell back was wacky flavor that were limited time only. Whether it was a soda or a cookie or a, a, a apple, anything goes. Wacky was, flavored apple. <laughs> hey, candy apples, man. Some weird shit out there. And you know it's like some weird, like, science lab, like some just scientific, Ugh. genetified words that just made up gobbledygook that's creating cotton candy apples because man was not meant to create such abominations that taste so good. But we did it. We did it. And I would buy them. And uh, it was always the thing that got me back. That's why I always genuinely feel like there's like someone out there listening. It's like, how many people gave up sweets this week? Well, Purnell, Purnell again? Shit. <laughs> again. <laughs> Putting them on the oh horn. God. What have we not done yet for Oreo? Well, we haven't. Ori, done... did you say Ori? <laughs> Ori? Yeah, why haven't you? Where's Ori Cole? Yet? 
I, I almost opposite but that didn't sound cold like that. Where's my Ori? Turn down where's the Ori at? Let me leave my holler and come she, get you. She's not even here and we found a way to, to get on your ass about Ori. <laughs> Her spirit's always here. We love Cole. Yeah. Speaking of things we love, we should probably talk about some games. I heard Tim yawn a few times. I know he's <laughs> exhausted from work. Nothing We're talking 12 hour days this week. 12 hour day. Oh my God, that sucks. Yeah, no. Well, there's got to be state mandated parent Q&A live streams about the reopening of schools. No. So, guess who's <laughs> your boy who knows how to live stream? No, oh, man. <laughs> Long production days for you now? Long. Well, the production, I mean, I just leave that shit set up and then and, walk in and turn it on and then make sure it doesn't catch fire, but... So does the vice principal, like, do, like, an announcement voice for the principal to come strutting out on the stage? Like, no, no, no. They won't do any cool fanfare or entrance music. Hey, uh, it's me, your boy! Your kids in school yet? <laughs> oh, my uh, God. They're not, yeah. It's, uh... Whatever, I'm getting that paper. <laughs> they say. That paper, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> Banking oh. ducats. Banking <laughs> the monies. Smashing them sodas. Yeah. All right, let's talk about games. First game to talk about tonight is called Bite the Bullet, developed by Megacat Studios, published by Graffiti Games, released August 13th on Switch, 14th on Xbox One for $14.99, coming soon to PS4 as well. Run, gun, and eat your way through this roguelike RPG shooter in a world where every enemy is edible. What you eat and how much you eat drives everything from your waistline to branching skill trees to weapon crafting in your stomach, of course. Shoot fast, eat big, satisfy your appetite for destruction. Tim, tell us about Bite the Bullet. Man, a lot of that sounds great, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> it does. Like, man, there are some some really cool, enjoyable ideas in this game. You, um, you what? I was like, if what I heard is like you actually make the weapons inside of your stomach. Yeah, the the, the whole the the gimmick around bite the bite of the bullet, um, and they they really is quite a bit of explanation is perhaps too much explanation as to why this is the case. It's basically like some virus or some uh, thing was invented for humans that allowed them to eat anything, to consume anything for nutrition. Just oh, literally anything, you, inanimate objects, animate objects, whatever, you can eat them. Um, and, and, and that's like one of the basic premises of this universe. And that premise is used to drive the gameplay systems of like, oh, it's a run and gun thing. If you, you, you shoot an enemy, they get low enough on health and they'll be stunned for a second. And then you can run up and then eat them. You can consume them, be them robot or mutant or whatever. You can then eat them. And when you eat them, it will restore a bit of health. Um, and each one has a fucking nutritional info breakdown. Uh, <laughs> it does. Well, because like they try to factor in like how many carbs you're eating, how much protein you're eating, how much fat you're eating to play into like your uh, like your, your character will be a, a bit amorphous. And depending on like how much you eat of what what is in what you're eating uh, your character might get like fatter and slower with with better defense, or they'll get lighter and faster and 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 stuff like that. They had to um, do that after Super Size Me came out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So so there's a system for that, and then like yeah, there's I guess like a weapon crafting looting thing. I guess I didn't understand that it was happening in your innards, but yeah, like you'll you'll come across a weapon and then stop. And you can compare your loot and de decide whether you want to pick up the new loot. Uh, it has like normal, you know, I guess what you would come to expect uh, from a shooter, uh, a run and gun shooter. It's like, oh, here's some normal ass guns. It's like your your spread shot deal and your your assault rifle long range machine gun deal. And then like just something that shoots bears. Sure. Like what? bear ghosts or like stuffed bears. Duff. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then there, then there's the weird shit. Yeah. And, and that stuff is in there too. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how the, that's the, the, the title and the concept of the world plays into the gameplay. My problem is I just hate playing it and like everything about it. <laughs> oh, um, God. That's like kind of my problems is I like the concept and the ideas 
and just like I just don't think they come together at all. Because like this is a game where you're you're like you're running and gunning, except you're stomping and stopping and chomping and stopping and comparing, you know, weapon upgrades. And it's not really like a a you, you, like you're constantly stopping. And then on top of that, you have to like watch what you're eating. Um, you know, early on, I guess it, earlier on, it's a little more straightforward. It's just like, yeah, I'm just kind of get eat anything, and who the hell cares about what my body turns into but once you get like into the skill trees they have different skill trees for if you want to be a vegetarian if you want to be a pure carnivore you can still be omnivorous there's a whole tree for omnivores but i chose to be uh, a vegetarian because i thought the abilities um seemed more interesting to me and so being a vegetarian that means you can't eat any meat um if you accidentally eat meat it will hurt you in fact it might even fucking kill you um Imagine how great I felt after I accidentally ate some meat and my character just died and I got a game over. Damn. How would I feel? feel? Shitty. Not good. Not fun. Um, uh, So, yeah. And it's just like... (laughs) Much like in real life, it's annoying to watch what you eat. To have to sit there (laughs) and count calories and stuff. It's like, no, I want to run and I want to gun. But even if I were just running and gunning, I don't really enjoy the running and gunning. Um... One of my pet peeves uh, in games in general uh, that, that manifests in this one in particular. So the first thing I'll do in any game is I'll crack open the old options menu. And, and one thing I always hate to see is games that even jokingly uh, like to belittle the player for their like, usually it's difficulty choices, choices, you know, usually it's like, oh, here's like tough guy difficulty and here's like baby mode. Yeah, here's baby mode. Wiener cry baby, baby mode. It's like, bro, maybe I just want to play the fucking game and chill out and make progress. Um, or in, monkey. Yeah, in in my advanced age, I am find much more appeal in easier difficulties in games because I just want to get through them and see what they're doing. Like a lot of the time, I don't care about uh, a stiff challenge anymore, and when I do care about it, like yeah, let's go, let's do it. Um, but this game, and it's. The control schemes. There's two different controls, control schemes the game presents you with. Uh, you, you cannot fully customize your controls, but one of them is called noob mode, and the other is like pro. And noob mode is where you have like your jump and shoot. Like you is <laughs> noob mode is where you have the buttons where you'd fucking expect them to be for a run and gun game, and pro <laughs> mode is when they're up on the shoulder buttons. So I'm what? like, okay, guys, that makes sense. Fucking whatever. Yeah, uh, I mean, maybe that's like how you prefer the game to be played, but I prefer to play it like I enjoy these games in the past. So that just like right off the bat, just like rubbed me the wrong way. Um, now, quick questions: but, If you were sure. to choose that mode and they did that button config. Is it locked into that button config too? I mean, you can just change it whenever you want, um, if you want to. But I, I, I don't like. No, I want to. You know, A is jump, X is shoot. That's what I want to do. Um, but like at the same time, uh, you cannot use the D pad to move your character, and that man, <laughs> what a noob move that is! Holy oh, shit! Oh no! What kind of? dope in a in a run and gun game would force you to use an analog stick and you know f- for what it's worth uh you can aim in slightly more than eight directions it appears to be like there's maybe 12 like there's there's two between like between right and up it appears there's like slightly above right and then there's slightly to the right of up um but i don't think that's worth it and you also can't there isn't a button to like plant your feet and hold your character where they are. So as you're using this analog stick to try to shoot, your character's like slippity sliding all over the place um, as you're just trying to aim and get a beat on something. And it just doesn't feel good and it never feels good. And the jumping doesn't feel good and the aiming doesn't feel good. Um, You can double jump. You can wall jump. They don't feel great. Um, They don't... Ah. There's like... Like, you really shoot off walls and, like, sometimes it's just hard to get your character going where you want him to go. There was, like, one section where there was, like, some spikes and pits and I kept, like, falling onto the spikes and I just couldn't get the jump quite right. And that's how I lost several lives and that's how I I started down the path of eating a freaking hamburger and then dying for my sins. (laughs) Um, So it just, like, doesn't feel great to, like, 
to do the running or the gunning as it is. And then you have to stop the running and gunning all the time to like, oh, here's a weapon. I need to compare them like, oh, here's some food. I need to make sure it's not going to kill me um, or at least make me too fat, fatter than I want to be. Um, and the game is not like, I, I mean, I guess if it's a rogue like and there's some manner of procedural generation to it that I that I didn't pick up on, that would explain why the level design is like kind of dull. And it felt like I was facing the same enemies over and over again. Um, and man, the music is also just did not like it just really wore on me, especially like the first song that just the first few levels of the game. It's the same song. And it's just like, man, it does not sound good. Um, just like top to bottom, I was just straight up not having a good time with Bite the Bullet. I Damn. like the idea behind what they're doing with the world and the mechanics, but I just don't think it gels together, and I don't think it plays very well. Uh, and I just didn't just didn't like it. even my even my son was watching me play. He's like, "Dad, this game isn't very good," and I said, <laughs> "I I know, Richard, I know." <laughs> That's the first game yeah. someone has to bite the bullet. <laughs> hmm. yeah. So what would you do to fix it? How would you improve the game? Oh, man, I don't know. You just freaking <laughs> get, get going with the sequel. Keep that concept and then just make everything else better. That's <laughs> <laughs> like, man, it's just there's no easy fix here. I, I feel like it's just like, yeah, I don't know. You know, they got the skill tree. They got the the idea of stopping and eating things like maybe like. Maybe it's just trying to do a little bit too much with the with the mechanics. Maybe it just needs to be streamlined a bit. Um, certainly, you need to have the controls on you know, movement controls on a D pad. You need to be able to stop your character to aim and shoot, and you need to just not be a dick in your controller settings. Yeah, not being a dick goes a long way. <laughs> it, you know, it just put a bad taste in my mouth from the start. Oh, wow. Well. But I've overcome such things before in other games with difficulty selections. Usually it just makes me roll my eyes. I'm just like, God, come on. You're not cool. You're not a tough guy. Don't tell me that shit. I can beat Contra without dying. Kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> you can beat Contra without dying? Yeah, easy peasy. Twice in a row. Damn. I can beat Godzilla on the Game Boy. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. I can. <laughs> and that skill hasn't gone away either. Like, I first did that, like, I don't know, like, 15, 16, 17 years ago, and I bust out the Contra collection, which has the Japanese version, which is harder because of the first run is tuned to the second run difficulty of the American version. And yeah, I can still, mm. can still mm. knock that sucker out. Still good at Contra. Damn, Don't need awesome. to put in that code. Don't even just need just need one man. That's it. <laughs> Wait, what? I, I, well, personally, I thought I misheard you, but I was like, I'm not going to bother because I think I misheard what you said about Contra, <laughs> the second run or something. But can you beat ghosts and goblins that were in that manner too? No, I've beaten super ghouls and ghosts, but not ghosts and goblins. I haven't committed myself to that one. Think of that game, oh, cool. super ghouls and ghosts. You have to fucking play through twice. I don't know who at Capcom was like, this sounds like a great idea. The oh kids will love it. <laughs> oh, it's the director. Like he's been interviewed as saying that he makes his games l- like to torture players. <laughs> what a yeah, dick. hey, bye. Mm-hmm put enough time into it i got to it and that's one of those games i just can't go back to it's like it's no no thanks can we just go over dick you know developers being dicks and it not working that well yeah but hey you know ghouls and ghosts super ghouls and ghosts has good platforming and uh some fun weapons and it's a dickhead in its own ways and great music so super ghouls and ghosts your review yeah, should, uh, well, man, I don't know if anyone should play Super Bowls and goes. It's scary, um, <laughs> but I'd rather play that than bite the bullet. Play Demon's Crest instead. There you it's go. A cool game. Yeah, I, I beat that a few years ago. Nice. I need to play that game. As that reminds me, download that damn Super Nintendo app now. Finally. Dude, wow, what the hell have you not done that? It's been like a year. <laughs> I know. It shocked me too. Come on, man. I was like, we should play games all live sometime, and I was like. Oh, I have the NES thing. He's like, oh, we can play some Super Nintendo. Like, they got a what? <laughs> oh, my God, man. It's no. been like a year. They've added like a dozen game. I put up the NES thing on That's there. That's like, <laughs> I said, I love that joke, by the way. A dozen game. <laughs> All these special editions of the same damn game. But actually, I, oh, yeah. I, the NES thing, it was like 32 games I hadn't downloaded. I was like, oh, there we go. That's Jeez. a trip. <laughs> 
Yeah, speaking of new like mode, like a lot of those NES games, they've got the SP version, which is I like I appreciate that. I appreciate. Yeah, that. me too. I mean, sometimes I like to start Zelda Two from a New Game Plus data, just because it's fun to not have to level up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just get straight into the action, go beat the dungeons again, and have it all done in like an hour and a half or so. Wait, what? I thought we're talking about Zelda Two. Yeah, Zelda Two: The Adventure of Link. So they have a mode where you start with like all your like with all the heart health and magic boxes. No, what you start with is uh, the maximum level of all of those. You still have to find the heart containers, but you're at life, magic, and sword level eight, oh, and you cool. uh, you keep the downward thrust and the upward thrust and all the spells. Yeah, like so you all never your have to go into stuff is there. Yeah, you never have to go into any towns, but um, all the keys, items, and dungeons are are reset so that you can just. You know, skip the towns and just blast straight through the oh, dungeons. I should try that. That sounds like fun. Yeah. It's so fun. I I Unlike play that so much more than, than the original <laughs> game. What? No, I was trying to get back to finish the review. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you got me on Zelda too. Yeah. Oh Jesus! All right. So yeah, bite the bullet. Your official verdict. Yeah. No, don't buy that, please. There's other good <laughs> run and gun games. I just talked about Hunt Down a couple months ago. That's great. If you haven't played Valfaris yet, that's great. If you haven't played Blazing Chrome oh, or Burning Chrome, Chrome, some yeah. some manner of of heated Chrome from last year. That's another <laughs> good one. Run to like the futuristic city on the side scroll. What's that? Was Hunt Down that game where you were like you could choose between three characters and it was yep. like a futuristic city? Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh shit! Oh, yeah, it got, got, got a little overlooked a couple months ago. It's a really, really strong uh, one of those games. I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, that, that sounds like from your review, it sounds like even like Bio Lab Wars would be a better game than this. And that game is like <laughs> at full price, it's two dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's on. It's like on sale for fifty cents all the time. Jeez. Yeah, I know. <laughs> all right, oh boy. Go to bed because i have to work 12 hours tomorrow <laughs> all right tim have yourself a good one and thank you as always do you have any final words I don't i don't good night also before <laughs> you know, i want to laugh at this so i did boot up the super nintendo app they added well there's not a lot of games on here it looks like it's like 10 rows so that was a surprise a lot of them were pretty much there when they first launched it they've only added like a half dozen yeah they have not added that many games at all it's depressing yeah, yeah just, you know, yeah, we can do. All right, it's because yeah. nobody can buy the controllers. Later. <laughs> See you, Tim. Have a good one. Have a good night, Tim. Bye bye. All right, moving on. Next game to talk about is called Death End Request 2, developed by Idea Factory and Compile Heart, published by Idea Factory International, released August 18th on Steam. 25th on PS4 for $49.99. This horror RPG follows Mai Toyama's search for her sister in a quiet lakeside town. She'll unravel clues to the town's past by day and battle shadow matter by night. Can you uncover the truth before reality is consumed by darkness? Purnell, tell us about this one. Okay, so Death and Request 1 was a game I actually reviewed for the show. Uh, I mm-hmm. guess like a year and a half, two years ago. I don't even remember when it came out directly anymore, but about a year and a half ago. And it proved to be a surprise like of mine. Like, even as far as idea factory concepts go, like it was, uh, higher on the higher end of the spectrum for me with that company. So, of course, when that then request two became noted, I was excited to get the review code because I didn't even realize it was coming out this soon. And I was like, oh, shoot, it's here. I'm going to play. So I put a, quite a bit of time into this bad boy. And, um, well, I'll, I'll get to the conclusion at the end. I'll describe the game prop first. So the premise of this game is, as Joe said, you are controlling a character named Mai Toyama, who at the very beginning of the game, probably, I will say has probably one of the more dark character intros I've seen in a JRPG in a very long time. Even though it's at the very beginning of the game, I don't even want to spoil it because it's one of those where it's like, holy shit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's what happens. And as a result of that event, she ends up going to this school for this basic, the equivalent of like a wayward school for girls in this podunk town. And um, the reason why she wants to go there specifically is because, like Joe said, that was she was in communication with her sister, or I guess called her strange sister, and lost touch about a year prior, and that was her last known location. So that's where she goes. And as things take place in her search, she starts to realize that things are not quite as they seem in this weird ass town. Um, so what ends up happening is there are two segments to the gameplay proper. 
So there's a full calendar. Well, not like a full calendar, like a 12 month one, but like a calendar that encompasses the events of the game. And each day, the game is broken up into two halves. There's the day element in which is more of the visual novel component where you are in the school for girls and you can choose areas on a map to go talk to specific people. And when you go talk to them, you'll get dialogue that tells you, I guess you learn more about the people that live there and you'll just have like general events where it's like, hi, um, I'm here to buy some, like my friend's here to buy some bread. And you learn about the girl who's shopping for bread for some rando at the church. Um, but you basically have a number of elm sequences like that. Sometimes it's just like character exposition. Other times it's like a little bit of story element plot that's being divulged. But you essentially can just like talk to people at the school and on the school grounds. The second component of the game is nighttime. When nightfall comes, shit gets weird. And uh, mm-hmm. at this point, my and if she has made any at the time, some of her friends will be on the street fulfilling missions and progressing the plot. And while you're out in the street, you're, you basically run around the town on like a typical idea factory dungeon trip, you know, a bunch of corridors lined up. But instead of being, you know, dungeon after dungeon, it's just one big town and you go to different areas of the town, depending on what the story wants you to do. Now, there are moments where the game will like put walls up, like fake walls up. Well, not fake walls, but more like weird glitchy looking walls that prevent you from going places until the game wants you to go to those places. Mm. But for the most part, you can go where they want you to go. And of course, later in the game, there will be areas where you can go that aren't really plot related at the time. And you might get a clue where it's like, we shouldn't be here right now, but you can still run around if you want. Um, <laughs> but, uh, as you run around the map, uh, you essentially have two things that can happen here. Well, yeah, two things that can happen. Here. One is basic combat. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. That's it's just the second thing. But, uh, the other thing is just like something known as buggy skills, in which case every once in a while you'll come across something on the screen, uh, that will allow one of your characters to use what's considered a buggy skill in the game to interact with it. For example, one particular character, um, has a, has a skill where when she's on a specific type of spot, she can jump and either go up to a higher platform or she can jump over like an obstacle, like a preordained obstacle. And in the case of another character, which, or the main character, Mai, she can hack PCs, which is kind of bizarre in how it works in this game because hacking PCs lets you do two things. One, it reveals hidden objects on the map. And two, it reveals hidden passageways. <clears throat> If you want to talk about a uh, lazy integration of a product, and I'll talk about more of that later, but specifically now, the like I said, the premise of this thing is that it reveals hidden walls or hidden passageways behind like thick walls. But the game has a mini map, and the mini map shows you every pathway that's existed, including <laughs> the ones that you blocked up by the, past, by the computer wall. So it's like, why am I even hacking the PC? I can just run into the wall because the mini map tells me I can go there. It's it was genuinely lazy on their part to not acknowledge that if they're going to have an ability like that, they should probably obscure the mini map for that purpose, but whatever. Um, and then there's battle. So battle <laughs> is an interesting element because previous, similar to the first game, um, they pretty much used the exact same battle system with like one improvement. And I'll talk about that. Well, right now. Um, so for those who did not play the original Death End Request, um, the way combat works in this game is that you're pretty much in like a circular arena. And in that arena, your opposition exists, and they could be one of three elements, sun, star, and moon. And it's a triangle, so much like the Fire Emblem Weapon Triangle or, you know, rock, paper, scissors, all that shit. And the idea is that um, every character can get attacks that can encompass any of those elements. So you ultimately end up doing like the same routine every battle, which is like you'll go to the search menu, You'll scroll over to check out the enemy, see what element they are, and then use the element they're weak against. Like, literally, that's what you'll do every battle. And now, admittedly, I don't have a big issue with that, because other RPGs, you'll have to remember it. There's no scrolling. You're just like, okay, he's clearly fire, so I'll use ice. So that I don't have a gripe with. In addition, um, there's like a sort of like a pachinko battle system, which I've kind of liked in this game. And that uh, if you hit an enemy with a skill that involves that offers up a knockback property, you can actually send the enemy flying across the screen. And if they bounce off of the exterior walls of the battlefield, they'll take damage. In addition, if they bump into 
another character on the field, that character can initiate a knockback as well and send the enemy flying in another direction. So essentially, you can set up like, you know, like pachinko or pinball sort of activity. The enemy is bounding around the map. Um, and then the last element before I talk about the new stuff that they added to the battles is uh, the glitch mode transformation. So on the battlefield, there are a bunch of like wacky looking warped tiles. And every time you step on a warped tile, you will get an effect couple that can be positive or negative and then it's coupled with a percentage increase in your corruption meter and once you break 80 percent out of 100 you go into glitch mode your character takes on a transformation resulting in their attacks becoming stronger and they also gain access to like a super move that instantly re removes their glitch status um supposedly you'll die if your glitch breaks 100 percent. but it happened to me by mistake once in a battle and i didn't die so i wasn't sure why that was whatever Oh my god, um, you're immortal. Exactly. <laughs> Finally, the death in request has had, you know. But um so that's basically how that plays. Now the two things that be added to the game are you can actually steal the benefits of those tiles if you knock an enemy into them through the knockback situation, which you couldn't do in the previous game. And for good reason, because in the previous game, there was a lot of mixed effects on the battlefield, a lot of really bad ones you could take on. But for some reason, this game, the developers saw fit to reduce the negative impact. So most, like I say, 90% of the time, those tiles will give you positive effects, which I think is definitely a detriment to the game because there was a bit of a tactical element to like knowing what tiles to use and knowing when a uh, perk was worth the negative effect that the tile would give you, stuff like that. Um, and then the last thing that they added to the battle system was something called Super Knockback. Super Knockback um, is something where when you press the button, just as you do the knockback on action, the character will do the super version, which makes the enemy fly even farther. And what usually resulted in battles for me was I would utilize this super knockback feature and I would just kill everything up until like chapter six. Like battles were a joke. I would literally go in, use some skills, do super knockbacks. Enemies would just like bounce around and get overkills and whatnot. Oh, by the way, overkills exist in this game, which gives you more experience if you do damage that exceeds the amount of hit points the monster actually had. Ha <laughs> ha. Forgot that part. So, <laughs> after every chapter, well, I should say not after every chapter, but during each chapter, whether typically during the, the evening hours, not during the day hours, um, there are certain events that can occur, which could result in you getting what's known as a death end. A death end is essentially a game over effect due to like a visual novel bad adventure choice. So it's like saying, hey, there's a hand sticking out of that well. What do you do? And you're like, I'm going to go touch the hand. And the hand pulls you in the ground and eats your face. Um, well, there you go. That's a bad end. And what happens when you do that is that it does like a bit of a marking on that chart that I told you about earlier, the calendar. And then the game allows you to reload the game back to the previous choice. So essentially, you are pretty much incentivized to make bad decisions just to see the bad choices in the game and get those death end scenes. However, there is also another element that they added to this game that was different from the other one, which might impact whether you want to do that or not, or you'll do like I did and just save, you know, like crazy. Um, at this new year main character has a bunch of girls at the school. And for reasons I will not divulge, uh, they can die. So, um, during events in the game, you, things can occur that will result in these girls dying on you. And you kind of don't want that to happen. Um, you kind of don't want that. Kinda. Like, what well, circumstances I mean, do you want that to happen? Well, some of these girls suck. And <laughs> they really do. <laughs> you're just like, you know, I just don't care. Fuck off. You know, Bitches. You fuck no. off. Now you're dead. You know? But other times, most of the time, I'm not that horrible. But there was the one there was the one person that died in the game. I was like, you know, I don't feel bad about this. You were kind of a douche and you should have paid attention. Fuck off. Um <laughs> so, Basically, you don't want these characters to die. So sometimes, depending on the choices you make, it might determine whether or not a girl lives or dies. And when that happens, the game progression doesn't stop. It just progresses under the impression that this character is now dead. So um, you'll be kind of be a little bit more mindful about that kind of thing. Now, hearing me talk about this and the fact that I honestly put a good amount of time into this game, considering the amount of time I had from when they gave us the code, because like, I was into it. So you might be thinking, you must really love this game. 
And to an extent, I do like the story. But there are some problems that I need to mention that, in my opinion, kind of make me feel like uh, that st- that statement they make was like, you can play this game while I haven't played the first game. Well, I would not recommend that shit at all. I would not recommend that. And I'm about to tell you why right the heck now. So. Do it. There are some elements to this game that, uh, well, they were lazy about some of the porty stuff. So, like, for example, you know, a lot of times sequels will carry over elements of the previous game, you know, because people like them or because it just makes sense. Well, in this game, they, they carry over a number of things that just kind of don't make sense. For example, in the first game, there were, you, you, the whole game takes place inside of an MMO. So there are MMO-type elements and video game-type elements in the game, such as camping or uh, the glitch mode as a whole. Um, but in this game, they brought those things back, but it doesn't make sense. Like, you're out in the town in the middle of the night doing things, right? So you're just out at night. You only have a certain amount of hours, but there's campsites around. With tents and tables and benches, things that made sense in Death and Request 1. But in this game, it's like, why the hell is this shit here? None of this makes sense. It's not thematic. It's just here because they decided they wanted to carry over elements of the previous game. Um, and instead of being like the NPC shop vendor that the first game had, just some random creepy guy in a mountain hut, like freaking North Star hoodie, who's just like hanging out the camps. I was like, want to buy some shit? Like, no. <laughs> Master, why are you following me around selling me dirty goods? Uh, but yeah, he's there for some reason, whatever. Um, so like, it's kind of that was like a thematic break. But the biggest one to me, the very biggest one is just, well, all of it. So there is a creepy story that's going on. And it's honestly a good story. But despite that, okay, this girl goes to this school. The first night she goes out. The evening hours, when you're in the town, it's not just a dark, gloomy town. It's got weird, like, red, veiny shit popping out of the walls. People aren't around. Uh, it just looks creepy as hell in a way that is clearly not natural. No one's phased by it. Like, literally no one's phased by this aspect of the town. The game never explains why. They just aren't. They don't care. And when the girls first start seeing monsters in town... Or well, at least the, from the main character, she's like, eh, I guess I better kill this thing. Like, what are you talking about? There are fucking <laughs> monsters in this town. At least the one girl that you be friends says something about, yeah, monsters have been popping up recently in the last, like, year or so. Which is still seems kind of odd to me because you would think that if your town was infested with monsters at night, you wouldn't fucking stay there. <laughs> Though there are reasons behind what's going on with that. But at least at that point in the game, in any aspect up until a certain element, your logical thought would be, why the fuck is anybody even in this town anymore? None of this makes sense. Well, and then, I mean, look the- at, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, like, look at what they do with, like, social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> Just social distancing. Stay in your rooms and don't go outside after midnight. That's pretty yeah. much they keep some freaking gremlins type shit. And then um, people are like, oh, I'm going to do it anyway. And then they die. And everyone's <laughs> like, that sucks. Who wants breakfast? <laughs> so that's literally how it plays out. Well, your classmate's dead. Who wants breakfast? Um, but then there's like another element. As there's two more elements I'll bring up. Um, because clearly it's like I'm just like ragging on this game that I seriously have been enjoying playing, but I have to do it. Um, the glitch mode genuinely, utterly, without a doubt, makes no fucking sense in this game, as it is by a narrative perspective. I mean, there is one thing that could make it make some sort of sense, but that's me taking a lot of leaps and an understanding of the first game and how the endings exist in that game. But, again, they don't clarify it. No one states this. So, to give you an example, the main character's best friend, who, by the way, has the worst name I've ever heard in a game. Her name is Rotten Dollhart. I'm not making that up. That's her damn name. Is God, I, I don't understand. Anyway, she has no idea what a computer is. She doesn't understand technology because she lives in Podunk her whole life, right? Um, and yet, glitch mode exists out this place. And when you go into glitch mode, she outright states, "Your glitch mode is so cute, bitch. You don't know what glitch is." <laughs> is you don't know what any of this shit is but apparently they all know what glitching is they know what glitch mode is despite the fact that why it doesn't exist why are you glitching out why is your town looking like freaking apple brown claw betty no one acknowledges any of the crazy shit that's going on outside of the actual narrative of the story and it doesn't 
make sense from a from a I guess thematic and narrative perspective. So it's like, why was Perno able to deal with all this stuff? Well, because I was invested from having played the first game. I liked it a lot, and I wanted to see where this is going to go to see when they eventually tie in the first game to the sequel. Because they're going to do it. They've already been doing it with certain elements in the game I've come across, which I can't spoil in the review. Um, but nonetheless, if I didn't have that investment from the first game, I would not have wanted to play this game. Because it makes no fucking sense, despite the fact that outside of the stuff that doesn't tie together, the general narrative has me intrigued. I want to know what's going on with this town. I want to know where the main character's sister is. I want to know these things. But I don't think I would have gotten as far as I did if I wasn't initially saying, why is she in this game? What are they going to carry on from this last one? Plus, when I went to the website, they show a bunch of characters from the first game, which, by the way, I will say this in, in a spoiler, but not spoiler way. They do bring in a bunch of characters from the first game, like as characters you can use in your battle party. But the way they do it also makes literally no damn sense, like <laughs> at all, at freaking. You know, I know I want to say it because it just it, it just makes logical sense to state it for the show. So, is it, just, um, is it one of those things like you know, um, the Scooby Doo gang? Like, oh, and there's the Holler, Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> no, no. Wish they did that. That would have made sense. <laughs> um, but um, again, the first game took place inside of a video game, right? So mm-hmm. there were a bunch of MMO characters in this game. You meet Sheena, who's from the first game, and she's like while talking about what you want to do in this town and what's going on, at one point she just says, hey, here's some char- here's some characters from our previous games. Because, you know, she works at a game company in the in that world. Um, she's like, here's some characters from our previous game. Maybe they'll come in handy. And now you're just fighting with them in your fucking battle party. Why does that exist? <laughs> Why does that doesn't make any freaking sense at all? None. None at all. But here you go. Now you've got seven, like six or seven new, you know, six new party members just, just like that, just give them to you, and it makes no damn sense at all. So it's like this is some of the laziest shit I have ever seen. And again, for those who are listening and have actually played Death in Request One, I do know the potential that lines up here. I don't want to say it proper on the show, but I do get it. By the way they explained it in the game, it still makes no damn sense. Period. It's just lazy. But I digress. My actual opinion on the game as a whole, I feel as though the game still can be fun to play for the story because there were a number of changes they made that were just kind of dumb. Like even I forgot to even mention it. Even the flash drive system is like worse now. So <laughs> in the first game, the flash drive system was in combat, you would choose three different attacks in your sequence of three. And depending on the order that you chose the attacks in and the level you were, you had a chance of unlocking new attacks. And the game would give you a percentage saying you have an 80% chance of unlocking a move if you do this sequence, right? So it would incentivize you to choose these attacks. And then if you see the percentage, like, okay, I should keep doing this until something happens, you know. It wasn't perfect, and I was hoping they would fix it and improve on it in this game. But instead, what they did was two things. One, which was better, being that sometimes you'll just get new moves by leveling up, which you didn't do in the first game. And then the second thing is the actual flash drive system itself. You sometimes still learn moves by doing a trio of moves, but you don't know what the heck is going to happen at all. There's no indication that you're going to learn a move until it happens. So you're just like, willy-nilly, oh, here's a move. I don't know what triggered it, but whatever. I got a move now. So it's like... I guess it works, but at the same time, I'm like, am I, should I be doing something to make this more efficient? Or is it just kind of happening? And that's actually how it's designed to be, so I shouldn't care. <laughs> Fucking no. I just know I'm getting moves sometimes, and that's cool, I guess. Um, but, I like um, how you could tell that you're really invested in this game. Yeah, I, I genuinely, I, I tell people all the time online, like, I think Death End Request 1 is, if you're a fan of, like, modern day JRPGs, you know what I mean, like the Compile Heart, Idea Factory, Gus, that, those brands, like, then I'm like, you should play Death End Request because it's a breath of fresh air from the genre as it is today. So I'm really, I really had some high hopes for this bad boy, but my takeaway from it is that if you have not played Death End Request 1, then 
you should play that one. That's where you need to start. Do not skip it for this because you're making a mistake by doing so. Play that game first and get the true ending. Or once you beat it, even just look up the true ending online if you want to do that. But either way, play through that game first. And then if you find yourself invested in that universe, then come to this game because despite the issues I named, you will want to progress through the game just to see when your characters will make an appearance, what the narrative is, what's connecting the two games together, those things. But otherwise, you're going to be like, what the fuck? What is glitching? Why are they doing this? Why does the tail look like grapefruit shit and no one cares? You know, <laughs> you know, it's just like there's just things that you won't care about and there won't be enough to keep you invested despite those things. Whereas I had those investments. So I was concerned. I was interested in going and I had a good time because of it. So well, it's a condition worth noting. Well, then I got to know 50 bucks. What is your verdict? I'd say try it if you played the first game. Deny it if you didn't. Sounds good. Chris, do you have any thoughts on it? I know you uh, put some time into it as well. Yeah. Um. So basically, I have no context going into this game. So I will say that... Uh, it's hearing this review. I'm like, okay, so I see that there's some things, most of the things I didn't understand do seem to be a holdover from the last game. Like I was expecting, I was like, oh, okay, well, it looks like they're all in a video game. So I guess that's a big reveal coming up. <laughs> so <laughs> may, I guess that doesn't happen. Um, but like, as it stands on its own, I am really invested in the story. Um, just, on its own, it's a good story about, like, somebody that's in a mysterious, like, place with these people who are hiding something and she's trying to find her sister. And, you know, like that, just on that level, um, you know, you've got the, the, the makings of, like, an interesting horror flavored story. Like, you know, it's not, I don't know that it's strictly horror. Usually when there's, like, trying to find somebody and you know like it's a rescue and an adventure like i don't consider it to be straight up horror but i don't know um the gameplay to me reminded me a lot of fairy fencer f advent dark force which i covered um but of course it took all the the delightful comment you know comedy from uh from fairy fencer and like replaced it with something that just made me feel like i was in a hot topic <laughs> So every character, every character in this girl's school is a lesbian, not for every other girl in the school. And that's fine. I'm a, I'm into that's that. That's that's okay. I'm the hot topic. That's what I thought you were talking about. Oh no no no! I'm just talking about the the gothy Lolita, like all the those types of things that were like I think a little more popular back in the day. You know when we were all still going to malls. Uh, <laughs> before cool. back when hot topic was hot topic. Back before it was just you know, video game paraphernalia. Et Dark Nico, what about lesbians? <laughs> it's a game about lesbians. The for school sure. is a lesbian. There you go. You'll yeah, love yeah. this. <laughs> oh my God. And, uh, and I think you can like kind of build on relationships and stuff, but um, in the game and like have multiple options there. Uh, but anyways, so say, in regards to that, though, just to get that. So people don't get that impression. And the relationship thing that I gathered from this, is less about building a relationship. It's more like if that character isn't dead, then you still get more narrative when you talk to them at school. But if they're right. dead, there's nothing to see. Cause I've, I got, I'm like three quarters of the way through the game at this point, And there's been like no real, like way to build up relationships with the other students. It's just more like following their narratives through. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, but that's what I mean. And that's the same way in fairy fence or F it's like, it's just to get, you know, just to get the story to go in like the the subplots to going in a direction that pleases you more <laughs> if you're like oh i like this character a lot more i'm going to pay more attention to her and then that you know ends up you know you get more out of that character um but yeah no it's not like it's not like uh an erotic game at all um but anyways so i like it because i like the action um of fairy fencer f along with the the whole like grid of power up like stuff on the ground. And I like, um, you know, when you hit an enemy and it bounces off the wall and hits another enemy and then hits another character in the trajectory and that character hits it and then it bounces off again. And, you know, that reminded me a lot of children of mana, which actually is a very underrated chapter that in the Cinco mode or a, a battle mechanic like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, Children of Mana. It's just like Secret of Mana, except every enemy that you hit goes flying, and if you can like hit them again while they're bouncing around, you do like you stack up all this damage and stuff. It's pretty fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, I like that about it. I like the story. Um, like I said, you know, as far as the setting goes and the fact that they're all in this like weird town that's and there's like glitches everywhere and all this other stuff. Like I, it kind of to me like harkened to like the Mary Skelter um, games, you know, where it's like, they don't really spend a lot of time explaining why, what the setting is. You just got to deal with it. <laughs> I'm glad you said it. Cause I totally forgot to mention something. I'm glad you mentioned. Mary Skelter. Oh no. no, 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 no. <laughs> we're like, more- we're like a half hour into this review. We have other Sh- games to talk. about. <laughs> <laughs> Shadow matter. Every once in a while, the berserker appears. And if he shows up, he chases you around the map. And if he catches you, it's an instant death. But he'll yeah. never catch you because he's really slow and you can just <laughs> run right around him. He's never caught me. And I've gotten right up in his face because I'm that badass. However, Damn, I thought I was doing good because I outran him. <laughs> so that's just <laughs> more never, smoke and mirrors. He will never catch you. At nice. worst, in battle, it can be an issue. Sometimes he'll pop up in a battle you're in. And that's okay. where he can be an issue because he'll get an attack radius. And if you end your turn in that attack radius, that character dies. So okay. that's something to watch out for. Okay. So I, I like it. I think it's good. Um, I don't know if it's worth 50 bucks, especially if you don't like to be confused by a game's like entire setting. But hey, I, I think as far as it being a Compile Heart fan, I enjoyed this game. Cool. All right. Well, moving on. Next game to talk about is called Is It Wrong to Try and Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon? Infinite yeah. Combate. Developed by Mages, published by P-Cube, released August 7th on PS4, 10th on Steam, 11th on Switch for $39.99. This JRPG follows the story of the anime Danmachi and adds brand new content. Enter the fantasy world of uh, Orario. Is that what it is? Uh, I don't know. All right. Enter the fantasy world of Orario, where gods live amongst humans and protect them and their familia and become the greatest adventurer through dungeon crawling, real time RPG combat and date events. Chris, mm-hmm. tell us about is it wrong to try to pick up girls in a dungeon? What was that shorter name that they called it? Don Machi? Yeah. OK, yeah, that's like a, a shortening of the Japanese title. I'm going to call it Don Machi or Girl Dungeon. Okay. Because <laughs> that title is way too long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will say it's it's intriguing. It definitely makes you want to like Google it up and be like, oh, I wonder. Is it um, wrong to have a long title for your game? To do what? I was joking. Like, is it wrong to have a long title for your game? <laughs> <laughs> well, like that's that's the funny thing though is that like that's that's how a lot of these animes go. <laughs> it's like it's now like full sentences for. Uh, for, you know, for things, which is funny because, like, one of my favorite animes is Trigun. That's all it is. It's Trigun. It doesn't stand for anything. Oh, I love there's, Trigun. There's, there's no triple gun or anything in the game, in the in the series. It's just, yeah, it's Trigun. <laughs> love it. <laughs> it's perfect. Anyways, um, I'm just, like, thinking of full sentence titles for Trigun now. Stop me. Okay. Oh, no. This, <laughs> this game, this freaking game, uh, is... Basically, a combination of a visual novel reimagining of the first season and like a kind of um, side story series of the uh, of the popular anime, uh, which I have not seen. I have not seen the anime, so I can't uh, draw too many parallels between uh, or you know talk about how it treats the story. But that's fine because. You know, why would anybody who watched an anime play a video game based entirely on it? <laughs> no, I just couldn't find it. I couldn't find a place to, like, sit there and watch it. Um, so it basically follows uh, this anime through its first season, and it basically is about a guy... Well, okay, so the world setting is that um, it's an RPG and it's real, like, real life or whatever. And, like, there's a dungeon and people are trying to get as deep as possible in it. And uh, back on the surface world, there are like so the adventurers are kind of split up into these um, families, familias and, um, you know, like a me familia. And um, at the head of the of me familia is a goddess. And that goddess like uh, basically imbues powers into um, the group and like, you know, kind of they're in charge of raising your stats, essentially. 
And it involves the character, like, getting naked, I guess. <laughs> the, oh, I didn't okay. realize that until the game was just like, we're explaining now that the character is naked. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, it's not an adult title, so they just... It, it's one of those things where there are nudity scenes in it, but it's one of those, like, if somebody's in the shower, like, you've got the white clouds covering everything mm. kind of deal. So it's, it's like, slightly a naughty uh, type of game, but completely... Um, wholesomely i guess anyways <laughs> getting naked up in here Woo! <laughs> always happens on boys night yeah anyway. we're titty streamers <laughs> now oh, okay great um <laughs> well i don't need to think too hard about this review then anyway oh, God. <laughs> so basically yeah these characters they're goddesses um you play as bell and uh he is a boy which, uh, although still beautiful, I mean, it's <laughs> it's no wonder that his ma- name means beauty. His looks have got no parallel. Anyways, <laughs> anybody oh, who gets that reference is... I know. Oh, yeah, I know. Everybody got it. <laughs> Anyways, so Belle uh, has this goddess who is a person who's kind of a roommate in his, like, shabby one-bedroom house... And uh, I think he's the only person in his clan. And so she's and she's like, I guess, in love with him or something. This seems to be something that probably got covered more in the anime. Like she just acts like that, um, that trope of like the uh, jealous, flirty type that the hero has no interest in. But there's no explanation as to why the hero is not interested or anything like that. So she acts like that. Um, He's trying to get real strong and uh, and get through this dungeon (laughs) and stuff. And then he finds out that, like, you know, when she's, like, raising his stats, which, again, involves him being naked, I guess, uh, we find out that his stats are, like, going through the roof. And uh, so he is, like, shaping up to be this, like, he could be, like, a great adventurer, but right now he's just a scrub. And he uh, runs into a- another team of, uh, of adventurers led by Aiza, who is a lady, who is, like, the strong but shy type. And uh, he he gets, like, trapped by minotaurs, and she saves him, and he runs away because she's just so gosh darn beautiful that the, <laughs> that the thing you do when you're an anime, and even no matter how attractive you are, like, if the other person is attractive, you have to run away from them screaming. And I so like how Dark Meek is just dropping all this knowledge in chat about this game, or about the yeah, anime. And I'm not, uh, yeah, and I'm not, like... Yeah, the person knows that. No, of course I know nothing. Like that's um, <laughs> that's because I've never seen the anime and I've played this game, and the game does not really explain the anime. So yeah, the yeah exactly. But the way the game treats it is that he's ashamed that um, that she's so beautiful. I don't know. That's that's how the game explains it. Anyways, so this is the visual novel part of the story and basically you go into town and through options you go to different areas and every area has a person you can talk to and as an option and you can talk to all the different characters in the game um and then eventually when you choose like you can also take on like side quests and stuff from the uh the quest giver and then eventually when you move the story along uh it will put you into a dungeon quest and then when you beat that dungeon quest it will then move on to the next part of the story and the game alternates between having Belle as the main character and then having Isa as the main character and so you kind of get to figure out both of their stories simultaneously um so basically um the actual gameplay part is where it just drops you into a dungeon and you run around and hit things with your sword uh that is kind of it there's a special move and there is a magic move sometimes if you have it and sometimes uh up to two other characters i think will join you in the dungeon and all they kind of do is they raise your stats in a certain way passively and they also like serve to do a special move um if you push like one of the shoulder buttons they'll like be a screen clearing flamey kick from the wolfy man and things like that and um so basically and the thing is, in the dungeon, you don't actually level up or anything, because leveling up is part of the story. And leveling up is apparently a big deal, because, like, your guy starts out at, like, level one, and Isa and her team, who are all, like, on the 50th floor of this dungeon, they're known as being some of the greatest adventurers on Earth, they're in, like, levels four and five. <laughs> so, 
uh, raising levels is not exactly it, but you are raising stats, but most of your stats get, and you can unlock like special, um, moves and things like that. But like mostly you gain stats through the storyline. So it really is kind of uh, more of a static thing in terms of like what kind of damage you can do and how how much you can raise the character outside of the story. Although you can uh, redo quests to gain money and like improve your weapons and things like that, which, com- you know, uses a, com- a combination of monster materials that get dropped and money, uh, which is kind of scarce. And in fact, it seems to be woven into the plot that money is a bit scarce. And, uh, yeah, so past that, you basically, like I said, moving the story along just by choosing story and then watching, you know, the visual novel part of it play out. And depending on, uh, how events play out, you can actually choose to date, uh, different characters in the game and, like, uh, start romances that the, uh, are non canon, let's just say. <laughs> so, yeah. Um,. So basically, yeah, it's kind of a way to play an alternate version of of the story. Like I said, of course, it kind of deviates from it once you start making certain choices. Um, but it really, to me, it's more of a visual novel with just like a, a splash of dungeon crawling. Like, you don't actually crawl through the entire dungeon. Usually there's just a, a like defeat 10 ogres and you know if you're much stronger than the enemies which if you're playing through isis chapters she's much stronger so the game uh kind of tilts it back to being challenging by being like you have to defeat 10 ogres in two and a half minutes and you know and like i said you just run around this dungeon um it's top down kind of zelda like a little bit uh cell shaded which is kind of nice music's good but it it does this weird thing that I noticed some cheaper games do where uh, the song will play and then fade out and then just come right back. So no, that's annoying when games that eat that or when they have a really bad loop point where you can like yeah. hear where it loops. Yeah. Sega CD was bad about that sometimes. <laughs> I think what the original Lunar or something anyways. So yeah, it's a fun game, uh, but really, uh, you are more playing it for the story. But I actually really like the action. It's very simple and straightforward, but obviously, you know, improving your weapon and then getting those insane stat boots and then going boosts and then going back into the quest and like doing much better than he did the first time around. I mean, I did game over a few times in this game, so it's not without its challenge. And of course, you can uh, raise the difficulty, I believe, a bit to, you know, uh, make it more so. But like I said, at the end of the day, it, this really does seem to be, uh, kind of a way of playing through the anime's like story, but changing things to your liking and then playing like a pretty good dungeon crawler in between. Nice. So overall, your verdict at $40? Um, at $40, I think that if you are a fan of the anime, which I think we have some of those in chat. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, yeah, right. Um, I think that it is pretty good, and I think that it will be a uh, a worthwhile thing to check out and pick up as a as a fun um, sort of side dish to like the anime that you like so much. As a game itself, it does run into like some little things that I think are um, on the cheap side. Like I said, the music looping, uh, no English dialogue whatsoever. Uh, the whole thing is voice acted by the Japanese voice actors. I think. At least that's what it says. Um, Again, I haven't seen the anime, so I don't know. But all of the voice acting is in Japanese with subtitles. So, you know, that's one thing as well. And like I said, the the action never quite felt super deep, but it was a good little challenge. And like I said, you know, I never minded uh, jumping back into the dungeon. So maybe for people who are looking to get into this game because they just want to see a cool visual novel dungeon crawler hybrid i'd say it's a try it for people who like the anime i'd say buy it nice and uh dark mika in chat says watch the anime you shits <laughs> oh i will i need to find a place to watch it or something like i where is it is it on crunchyroll or something uh, i don't really i don't watch i don't watch a lot of anime so i don't know i always the only reason the only way i watch it is if it's on like uh netflix or like the blu-rays around or something <laughs> I don't watch any anime. Yeah, that's a thing, too. Yeah. 
All right. Next game to talk about is called Faria, developed by Abraham Entertainment, published by Versus Evil, released <laughs> August 13th on Xbox One and Switch for $19.99. With its unique living board, Faria will challenge you with its truly strategic card battles. Craft your deck, shape the battlefield, and fight for victory. Purnell, tell us about Faria. All right. Faria is actually one of those examples of a game where when people like to talk about how I haven't done it, like you can't play a lot of board games during the, you know, CD times. And folks will be like, well, in the meanwhile, why don't you just come on like tabletop arena and play board games there or whatever? And I generally respond by saying, if I'm going to go and play a video board game, I want to play a video board game that exists only as a video board game because, you know, they're designed with this in mind. And, uh, the hiccup, of course, is finding quality titles that hit that spot. But Faria was an unexpected treat for me in that regard, in which now I actually do very much enjoy playing it. And it'd be kind of cool if I knew other people that played it, too. Kind of jumped the gun on the actual impression of it, but I should talk about the game itself now. Yeah. Faria <clears throat> is a game where the goal is that you are on a board, and on the other end of the board is your opponent. You both have I guess like spherical orbs that represent your characters and each of those orbs has a hit point base. The goal of the game is to deplete the other player's hit point pool. So think something like how Yu-Gi-Oh would be in that regard. However, the difference is that unlike, whereas those games usually just play cards in this game, you have to play cards while also building a board with which to use those cards. So at the beginning of the game, the map doesn't exist. It's just, here's a bunch of available tiles and there are your two players. You have to use the ability to terraform on this map to either construct two non-element-based terrains, tiles, in which case you just choose where to go on the map. They have to be intersecting and touching a tile that you've already placed or your, of course, starting place. Or a tile adjacent to a tile that your character, one of your characters is on. Um, So you either can place two non-descript element terrain tiles or you can place one specifically terrain-based tile. The reason why you'd want to place terrain tiles as opposed to non-descript terrain tiles is because there are certain monsters you can play from your deck of cards that can only be placed in the event that a certain number of those tile types exist with your, you know, based off of your side of the board. Um, I mentioned earlier just now placing monsters. Yes, in addition to placing tiles, you also have cards in your hand. You start with three at a time, that you can occasionally spend a resource to draw an additional card. Um, but you end up using these cards to either summon monsters to the field with which to either defend your main guy, mine for additional summoning resources called fairy in this game, or to approach and attack opposing monsters or eventually the opposing base. Um, there are a lot of different cards in this game that come in a variety of different types, like direct attack ones. Um, there are monster tiles that actually work as totem poles where you just summon them and they'll just kind of stay in place and do an effect until someone destroys it. There are cards that can bestow abilities on other cards when you play them. Um, some of them have various traits, like, for example, the most obvious one to note is Taunt, where if the character has that, the enemy cannot walk their monster past it. They have to beat that monster before they can move on um, on the board. So they're kind of good for like stalling opposing forces. Um, this game, by description, is actually surprisingly hard to describe, but in execution, it works extremely well. Um, you're essentially just coming out of the field, you know, summoning monsters, generating Faria, which is the resource, um, defending yourself while approaching the opponent to ultimately try to take them out. Now, at the end of every battle, you will get experience points. And when you get a certain number of experience points, you unlock additional modes. You'll also, depending on the level and also beating an opponent, you'll unlock new cards that you can put into your deck. Sometimes you'll actually unlock new starter decks even. So you can take the starter deck and then use that as a base to build on a new deck or just use the starter deck as a whole and play with that. Um, you can do puzzle modes when you unlock the puzzle mode, which is where they give you a terrain layout and your goal is to solve it in the number of turns required with the amount of, with the types of cards they make available to you. Um, and there's like a co-op mode where you and another person or AI can battle against the enemy in and of itself with a, like an increased hit point pool typically so they can stand a chance against you. Um, but 
And there's also like a big boss mode, which I didn't actually get around doing much with, where you basically fight like a boss type opponent. And they kind of make you like specialize your decks in order to like do your best against them. Um, there is a purchasing option in the sense of like using in game currency or also normal money to buy new cards or to buy cosmetic items like new well looks or new avatars for your base. But honestly, I feel as though they give you a decent chunk of stuff to do, and a decent number of things you can play around with it. Honestly, you may well never need those things. I never foresee myself spending real money on this game for that kind of thing. That's just how I've always been. Um, but you can earn like fake currency, like you know, in-game currency also with which to use to buy some of the cosmetic stuff. If that is your cup of tea. Um, all in all, this game has is a one of those games that again it hit the it hit the stores. I had never heard of it, but when I saw it pop up on the video, I was like, you know, this is like they brought my alley. And having played it, I have been able to confirm that this is authentically legit. Like I think this game deserves a lot of love. And of course, the larger the player base, the more active the online community will be. Very um, true. I, I feel like there's only one complaint I would have about it, and honestly, this is something that. In all due honesty, they could just as well fix on their own if they really felt the need to do so. Which is that um, I wish the maps were more diverse as far as like their starting layout. Because generally, you're starting out on a map that's empty, except for maybe a few wells with which you're going to try to pursue to get resources from. But if it was more like an Advanced War style game where they had certain areas of the map that were already pre-filled, so you had to kind of plan around how you wanted to build around those things. Or if they move the wells around in a way where it's like, hmm, there's a well in the center of the map. We might have to fight to get to that bad boy and see if we can get there first. Um, but stuff like that kind of shake up the terrain battle. Um, but overall, it's basically a matter of outwitting and outplaying your opponent. Because in addition to having the right monsters to play and the right resources to play, you also want to know just how to build out your terrain so that you can have the ability to place monsters further out on the field. Because you can't place on the opponent's tiles, only on your own. No. So that still allows you to get some fun out of it. Or not fun out of it, but it still allows you to kind of work around the map. But I just wish the terrain itself was more diverse from the start of battle sessions. Yeah. No. Well, overall, 20 bucks on this one. What are you thinking? I think it's a solid buy, especially if you're already down with the board game swirl like I am. It's kind of a no-brainer on this one. I am cool. glad that it's just to play it. Awesome, and hopefully the online picks up and uh, they, they build themselves a nice community. This one sounds pretty awesome. It is. Awesome. All right, next game to talk about is called Pixelbot Extreme, developed by Playheart Games, published by Fusion Play, released August 4th on PS4 for nine ninety nine. Play as the rocket-powered pixel bot as you shoot, fly, and dodge your way through 25 handcrafted levels while collecting orbs, weapons, and unlocking extreme challenge levels. Shoot, die, respawn, and most importantly, never give up. Chris, tell us about Pixelbot Extreme. Okay, Pixelbot Extreme. Well, it is about a cycloptic robot. There's a robot with one eye and a, a big gun. Uh, who is freed from his prison to try and escape some space thing from some guy like called the mastermind or whatever. I don't know. The plot is minimal. What it is is that it is basically a, a an auto runner. However, well, I guess an auto scroller because you're not running. You're actually jetpacking through these stages. And um, what you're doing is shooting enemies as they pop up and also collecting orbs, which give you like a... Um, Basically, they, you know, they absorb a hit for you, but there's orbs all over the place. So you can kind of, um, if you can collect them, then you get like, you know, stuff. And then the, there uh, are also letters in each of the stages, which spell out pixel bots. So there's actually quite a lot of them, I guess. And I guess that would be eight. And uh, if you can gather up all these things and destroy enemies and stuff like that and like, you know, do well, then you get like the little trophy and uh, you can unlock um, some other stuff. And, of course, you have to get, like, a certain amount to, like, really proceed in the game. So you do have to get through the levels pretty well. Um, so the main thing about this game uh, that separates it from others of its ilk is that um, enemies on screen will be in a variety of colors. And the um, you have to shoot them with a shot that is the same color that they are. And um, that also translates to, like, obstacles. Even boss fights have, like, um, 
you know, have like different colors that you have to be shooting. And the cool thing is like, and you, you unlock one at a time. So you get to do like a level or two with just the one shot and then it introduces a second color and then a third color and a fourth color. Uh, the way you shoot different color shots is that they're different buttons on the PlayStation controller and the colors of the shot coordinate with the actual color of the controllers. So like circle is red, um, cross is blue, triangle is green and square is pink. Mm. And so when you see like, you know, you'll see like a row of like a pink, green, blue and red enemy. You have to shoot them in that order um, because the other bullets will just bounce off. And of course, if you can't do this in time while the game is scrolling and it does scroll, it it really uh, really motors for an auto runner. Um, Yeah, if you can't like get that done, then you take a hit. And if you you know lose your orb, then you get killed and you have to start over um, from the checkpoint. There's several checkpoints in the levels and stuff. So it's not a merciless game it is fast moving and it is very challenging um in fact i found it really difficult but not in a way that i was like uh this is unfair and badly designed i was like no this is well designed it's just it really demands a lot out of the player like you really have to keep in mind like you know like you kind of see a group a cluster of enemies coming and you're like okay it's going to be two reds and then there's two greens and then it's alternating red and green until the end and they're like stacked on top of each other so you're kind of blasting a path through them um and of course when you see the letters you're like oh i gotta get up there and get that letter because that's how i 100 percent this thing and that's what they want me to do um fortunately the game has three difficulty modes um so like easy mode they uh they kind of take away the gravity a bit and um if you get hit you get iframes which <laughs> you don't get too many iframes uh after you're hit in the in the first in the normal difficulty well and in the hard difficulty but yeah they, you get iframes in it basically and they lower the boss difficulty and then like normal mode which is what i played on it it you still get iframes but it's you know everything else is just normal baseline and then hard uh, orbs don't do anything for you except act as collectibles. You don't get shields from them. You get one shield in boss levels and 150% boss difficulty. Jeez. So, yeah. And not only does the game have like a normal mode where, you know, you're progressing through and collecting stuff and like trying to unlock the different levels. Uh, it even has a speedrunner mode where you get to do it with a timer and, you know, all this other stuff. So it's definitely a game designed from the ground up to challenge people who like challenges. Um, but I did find it accessible at least, um, for my not great at auto runners ass. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there's a lot to enjoy here because the pixel art is really good. Um, the backgrounds are like, you know, even though it's like spaceships and, you know, whatnot, it's like, it still looks really good. And the animation is good. The music is this bass heavy synth music. That's like really pleasing. Uh, there's a lot to like in this little game. And I think, uh, the only turnoff for people would probably be the difficulty, but it's one of those games where the level's the same, the exact same every time. So eventually, you know, if you're not great at like running it through instinct, at least you can keep going and kind of memorize it and then get through it. No. But I think the hardcore will find a lot to like here. Well, 10 bucks, what do you say? Yeah, 10 bucks. That's a good price that pretty much hits the nail on the head for a game like this. So I'd say go ahead and pick it up. Awesome. All right, next game to talk about is called Norman's Great Illusion, developed by Civil Savages, published by Sometimes You, released August 19th on Xbox One, Switch, PS4, Vita, and PC for $4.99. Have you ever wondered why individually good and peace-loving citizens merging into society allow the coming power of forces that have diametrically opposed their principles and goals? Norman's Great Illusion is our attempt to talk about this phenomenon. Purnell, what the hell are they talking about? Well... Norman's Great Illusion is a game where you portray the role of a man named Norman. He is a guy who works at a factory that produces stuff. And you are pretty much living his life. Now, the way this game does it is it conveys Norman's existence in a way that is about as mundane as his actual existence is, which is intentional. I'm pretty sure of it. So what do I mean? Well, you are living in a calendar of a year, a calendar year of one year, though you don't portray every individual day. You just kind of show up like, like it might be like day 15 and the next day, like 
day 100, just depending on how the narrative breaks down. But it's not day after day. It's sets of days or in the periods within the calendar. Yeah. So days are always you wake up, get dressed, you sit at the breakfast table with your wife and your kid, and there's a conversation that takes place. Conversation is usually just, it's not quite flavor. It's just more like getting an impression like what's his family life like that day. And then you leave the house. And at that point, you have to drive to work. And driving to work is a mini game where you have a bar that's going left to right. And when the, when the, and there's a, within that bar, there's a bar within a bar that's going left to right. <laughs> and within that bar, there is a colored section where when it turns green and your sliding bar is within it, you press the button, X button, or rather the, I guess the freaking, there it is, the A button. Freaking numb those button combos. Press the A button to make it stop. And as long as you nail the timing right, nothing happens. But if you screw up the timing, you damage your car. And if you do too much damage to your car, you have to pay to repair it. You get to work. And once you get to work, Norman has to do his job. What is Norman's job? Essentially solving fast math equations. You get 10 math equations a day, broken up five, break them five. And you have a timer that plays out while you have to solve the equations. And if you screw up five times, you get sent home and fined. If you succeed, you don't get sent home. You get your base pay. If you can knock out all the equations without missing more than two of them, you'll get a paycheck bonus. Oh. Uh, now, it's funny because they even use ratios in this thing. And just I had to get this out of the way. For all those people who solve those stupid-ass math problems on Facebook, they use fucking PEMDAS in this game. Get over it. Um, now, after this situation, you drive home, go to the exact same, you know, hit the button mini game, get home, have dinner with your family, go to bed, and then you do it all over again, over and over again, except every once in a blue moon, an event will occur. Oh, I forgot to mention this. This is the best, the funniest part. When you get home from work, they tally up your daily accruals, as in how much you earned at work, how much you spent throughout the day. Any penalties you've accrued, and then they'll give you a total remaining balance in your bank account. You start the game with 300. Fun fact, you always lose money. Doesn't matter what you do, you will lose money. <laughs> sucks. If you get a bonus, you'll just lose less. But you're slowly going broke no matter what you do. Now, in addition to the stuff I already mentioned, every once in a blue moon, an event will occur in the game, um, in which case you have to make a decision. And this decision will likely drive the direction of the game and how it takes place. Um, and the st all the decisions kind of revolve around the idea that there is a bit of an uprising of prepping to take place in addition to a uh, upcoming election where the status quo will be maintained. Now, I'll give you one example of, an answer, of a situation where I had to respond to where I was leaving the house and you come across a guy that's getting mugged. The game says such and such is getting mugged. He was a unscrupulous businessman who, um, pretty much no one liked because he only catered to rich people. I chose between three options. It was uh, call the police, try to stop them from beating him up, and ignore the entire event. I said, maybe I can convince them to not beat this guy up. I got beaten up. Then my job penalized me $150 for coming in late. <laughs> I got, and then I still went to work and went home in the whole $110. Wow. <laughs> It's a pretty fucking dystopian world this game takes place in. It's shitty. Shitty, shitty, shitty. Um, but then as things progress, um, situations occur based on your choices that you make. And then eventually, it will ultimately play out to its inevitable conclusion. One of a variety of different endings can take place. Because ultimately, at its core, it is a visual novel. You're playing through a story with the occasional choices that are going to affect your life. And how Norman's life plays out. Um, I've gotten a few endings in my play. None of them were happy. <laughs> Just different forms of sad. Um, but the odd thing about this is I don't look at it as a game. It's more of an art piece at this point. Um, because they are, there's clearly a message they're trying to convey when you play this game. And I'm all for people using art to convey messages as long as it's not like hypnotic or nonsensical like that. In fact, every day you leave the house to go to work, they give you a new quote. <laughs> or like think like you know the power of the people lies in the hands of of the people not the machine or something like that. i just made that one up but essentially they give you 
dialogue that is meant to convey, you know, don't be, don't remain just a cog in the machine, you know, no. step against, you know. Um, and all after that is core, I will say I enjoyed my experience with the game, but I'm not going to say I enjoyed it as in this was a lot of fun. It's not meant to be fun. It's not fun and it's not meant to be fun. It is an art piece where you're playing through this guy's life and experiencing the outcome of the life based on your choices and just kind of taking in what the messages the developers wanted you to take in. And then you decide how you feel about it on your own. Um, and it's because of that that I feel like my rating of this game will not be rated as a game. Because as a game, it's like, ugh, no, not good. Um, but as an actual art piece that is using the game medium to convey it, I honestly think it's a buy it, especially because that the price isn't half bad. Like, yeah, it's I, only five bucks. So. Yeah, I, you can, I can see this game being played, like, get like two or three endings off of it. Feeling like, okay, I experienced this for what it is, and now I'm done with it. But um, that's kind of my takeaway for it. I would say if you're the type of person that's interested in like artsy type games, like games that are like more of an art piece than an actual game. And this is an easy buy to experience that art. But if you're looking for an actual game to play and experience and enjoy and talk about, this is not the game for you. Walk away. Sounds good. Don't tell it to Norman, though. He might start crying. <laughs> All right. One last party game to t- or a uh, party cast game to talk about is called Prehistoric Dude, developed by Light Up, published by Rattalaka Games. Released August 11th on PS4, 12th on Xbox One, 14th on Switch for $4.99. Go on an adventure to help prehistoric dude take back his lunch, which was stolen by a giant dinosaur. You will need to face many dangerous enemies while traveling through caves and forests, getting some tools and power-ups to assist him during this journey. Chris, tell us about prehistoric dude. All right, prehistoric dude. Well, I <laughs> this is something I probably have brought up before, but I'm like weirdly a huge fan of the caveman genre <laughs> of video games. <laughs> I guess it all started with Joe and Mac on the uh, Super Nintendo, which I was really into, and the Caveman Games, Jalico game on the NES. But I don't know. I just I click collect them and stuff. So I was really happy to see that Radalika has a Caveman game that is actually like kind of a Metroidvania uh, or exploration adventure game, if you prefer to to not use other properties to describe properties. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Whatever. I don't care. Um. So, yeah, Prehistoric Dude is about a caveman named Dude who is, uh, you know, relaxing to his lunch, which is a, you know, on I guess breaking up his, his very busy day of wandering around and <laughs> eating lunch. And, uh, yeah, his, his gigantic bone-in ham gets, you know, stolen, which is, you know, a great motivation, I think, for any caveman. It very much harkens back to, like, Bonk's adventure and stuff like that. Um, well, he was trying to save a princess, but ham was involved. Anyways, so, yeah, uh, it's, it's very, a very simple story. It's, it's one man trying to get reunited with, with some lunch meat. And, uh, he, um, so, like, basically, you run around, and uh, interestingly, so it's a, you know, side-scrolling platformer kind of thing, which is that, you know, you you got enemies like snakes and, like, you know, lizards and stuff like that that you have to defeat. Um, the way that you do this is actually by um, running across bushes where, like, weapons will appear and things like that, and... Um, you collect the weapons. Uh, they're like represented on screen. You also collect fruit for reasons I'm not entirely sure of, <laughs> but um, yeah, like you have a limited amount of like you know axes to throw at like these you know snails and and bees and stuff. And once that's out, you just kind of have to dodge them until you unlock until you actually find a melee weapon in you know through exploration, and then. Uh, you're even limited on your melee weapon because you have a, um, on top of like your life meter, you also have a magic potion meter, which I'm just guessing is just straight up your energy. Um, and so like it takes a block of energy to swing a club, uh, or whatever, I guess, melee weapon you have, which is a club. (laughs) Um, and yeah, you can only do it a couple of times before you have to like wait for your like actual magic to refill magic energy, whatever it is. And yeah, so that's an interesting thing about this game is that there's no like straight up thing that you can just spam. Like you either collect 
projectile weapons or you, you know, wait a second for your two swings of your club. Um, but yeah, once you get through that, uh, it's all about finding the items that will help you get through um, the next, like, you know, obstacle, like any sort of game like this. Uh, like when you find the mountaineering gloves, you can now cling onto ledges, which kind of acts as the double jump. So I'm going to go ahead and count that as such. Uh, <laughs> and it is one of the first things you find. So this game goes pretty quickly to um, double jumps. But I like that it's it, it requires a wall to be there. Um and, you know, of course, this game is not realistically proportioned, so there's just, like, floating walls everywhere. <laughs> uh, and then, like, uh, and then, like, you know, I, I really like the simplicity of some of these things. Like, uh, for instance, in order to travel, like, through water and stuff like that, like, you have to find a bamboo stick, like, so that you can breathe through it like a straw. Nice. Yeah. And um, then, yeah, eventually you come across bosses and defeat them and, uh, you know, that gets you more stuff and you just explore until the game's like completely done. Um, I really love when Metroidvania style games keep it simple um, because it really is just fun to like run through the game and explore it. Uh, It's got a really nice kind of chipper soundtrack by uh, Nicole Marie T., who I actually follow on Twitter, and I don't know why. <laughs> I think just because I found out she's a composer, and I was like, well, click follow. <laughs> but, um, you have high standards. Yeah, it was interesting to see like her name in there, because I you know, was not too familiar with her work prior, and it's a very good soundtrack, so you know, I randomly selected correctly. Nice. Um, yeah, and the graphics are really cool. Like They're very simplistic, like kind of eight, 16 bit style i'd say but it has some cool effects like when you defeat an enemy it rotates you know towards the you know screen and stuff like that a little bit like you know ninja turtles in time uh that kind of thing and uh yeah and also like occasionally there will be like a rain effect that will come up and things like that it's just there's a lot of like little touches in this game that really give it a lot of personality and I just like the character. Like, dude doesn't have any dialogue or anything, but he's got that <laughs> he's got that one tooth that sticks out, and he's like so impressed with himself that he found a bamboo stick. It's just I don't know. This game is just a, a joy to play. It's not too bad on the hard side. It I really did not find myself like stuck at any point. It was it's just a good romp. Nice. And it's only five bucks, so what's your verdict? I absolutely buy this one. This is one of the better Rattleica games, in my opinion. Um, yeah, like, if you're looking to, to get into the world of $5 games that give you all the trophies immediately, then... Because <laughs> you do... <laughs> the the earliest you can get every trophy in this game is beating the second boss. Which nice. is pretty quick. I'd say, like, maybe an hour or so, or half an hour if you're pretty quick at these kind of games. But yeah, it's fun. Go play it. Nice. Yeah. All right. Well, that is it for the party cast. We do have a couple of more games to talk about, so we are going to go to those. Uh, do either of you have any final words before we move on? You might want to move on because if you don't, I'm going to talk about death and request. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Shout outs to Erica Mendez, who is a voice actor that's in like every video game. I, I heard her voice immediately in death and request. I was Which like, character? there she is. What? Which character was she? Uh, Roddy. She was also Aaron in Fairy Fencer F Advent Dark Force. And I hear her in stuff like she's a an, an NPC in uh, Octopath Traveler. Hmm. Oh, nice. So she's just got that distinct, like, childish voice that every time I hear it in a game, I'm like, who is that? And I look her up and I'm like, oh, it's the same person every time. <laughs> <laughs> Shout outs to her. She's great. All right. And moving on, we are bringing in uh, someone strange to the show. It's their first appearance on the show. Cole, how are you doing? <laughs> Hi, I'm new here. You and missed the party cast. <laughs> I did. Sometimes you got to have a mental health day. And uh, right now I need about a mental health month. <laughs> but we're going to roll with one day and hope for the best after that. All right. Well, we won't make you do too much. We'll just we'll, we'll get through two quick reviews and then we'll let you get going. Does that Sounds sound good? good? Does sound good. All right. Next game to talk about is called Helheim Hassle, developed and published by Perfectly Paranormal, released August 18th on Xbox One, Switch, and Steam for $19.99. Helheim Hassle is a narrative adventure game with puzzle platform elements. Play as Bjorn, a pacifist Viking that can detach and combine limbs at will to solve challenging puzzles and get out of uncomfortable situations involving desperate Norse gods, goblins, dragons, and angry skeletons. Cole, tell us about this one. So I want to start by saying that Helheim Hassel has 
um, a very morbid sense of humor. If you have played Manual Samuel or if you have played Flipping Death, you're already on board for the kind of jokes that are going to be involved here. They are not for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and personally, I love this shit. You know how like I turn my nose up at like immature potty humor mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh, I don't like it, but whatever, right? But this, this morbid humor... <laughs> This is my shit. <laughs> I love dark comedy. And this is just darkest of the dark. Um, and yet it's all presented in this like cartoonish, humorous, over the top, goofy manner. Everything is so bright and cheerful looking. And then you remember that Bjorn is a Viking who accidentally fell on a bear. T- covered in explosives and he has been exploded into multiple body parts and he is very dead he has a grand viking quest that he gives absolutely no fucks about (laughs) he does not want to do this shit he does not care about this shit and he will let you know the whole way this is not his shit every other viking around poor little Bjorn is like you know this is fucking great we're going to go to war and die and go to Valhalla. You know, the can't wait for a giant, um, a literal giant to slit my throat. <laughs> There's a little girl who's like, I'm going to take a giant spear to the eye and it's going to be wonderful. And you're just like, okay. <laughs> and at the same time, you feel, you feel horribly awkward about this little girl being so excited to die by a giant spear to the eye. <laughs> and then at the same time, you're like... <laughs> It's pretty funny. (laughs) (laughs) It is. And then Bjorn like runs home and is trying to find a place to hide. And and his family's like, well, I'm going to go get my throat slit now. And you're just like, oh, my God. (laughs) And they're so excited for it. He's just like, fuck this. I'm out. And still ends up dying tragically anyway, which means he should get to go to Valhalla. But first, he's got to go all the way through uh, Helheim. And uh, all that that entails He meets a wonderful cast of characters I absolutely love Pesto Who will just go If you <laughs> leave the game setting Pesto will rant without repeating anything For like 30 minutes straight Oh my god It's incredible I was certain there had to be an achievement And I just wanted to just sit and let, <laughs> listen to him rant oh my While god. I was working on other things I was just like let him go I'm having such a good time listening to the poor pesto bitch endlessly that I'm I'm just here to see what he says next. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I loved it. There was an uh, a goblin who was just like, "Well, you didn't figure out the cave puzzles already, did you?" And you're like, "It's a fucking tutorial. Why is this guy so proud of the obstacles he's put in the way for me?" <laughs> <laughs> He clearly needs to step up his game. Um, and the <laughs> that leads me into the actual gameplay of Helheim. Uh, Hel- Helheim. I can never pronounce that properly. Helheim Hassle. And that is that it is a puzzle platformer. But it's got a little bit of a twist. Remember how I said that Bjorn dies in a, an explosion of body parts? Mm-hmm. Well... Bjorn can now detach his body parts in order to overcome the obstacles in his path. So you start off learning that he can pop his head off and that there are clearly perks to this. Um, Also cons, the head alone can roll, which means it can get into tight spaces, but can't jump. But the body can jump, right? Mm -hmm. And it jumps higher if it doesn't have a 10-pound head attached to it, yeah? Yeah. Makes sense. So you can jump a little higher when you don't have a head. But then you've got to take into consideration um, how you're going to move both body parts so that at the end of the puzzle, you can put Bjorn back together. This usually requires, you know, throwing the head or eventually you can take off, you know, individual legs and individual hands and how those come to be detached from the body are just every bit as gruesome and morbid as you could imagine. And it's incredible. Um, at one point, Pesto puked my hand up and I had looked away for a second. And I don't even know how that happened. I don't know what led to Pesto eating my hand, but he puked it up for me. So that was great. It's beautiful. 
And then after that, I could throw my arm to wherever the fuck I wanted it to go. <laughs> but that also means that you you interact with the world differently based on what parts you remove. You can't carry your head and climb onto some ropes or climb a ladder. You need two hands for certain tasks. So if you're if you're holding your ha- head and and trying to like climb another object sometimes it's just not going to let you do it if it's a two-handed task whereas um i already mentioned that you can't you can't jump if you cut your head on you don't jump aside so you may need to actually throw the head over an ob- obstacle to get it through um sometimes you may need to throw a, a hand and a leg and then join a head and the leg and then just join those two items those two body parts together to overcome um, the path so that you can unlock a gate which will let the rest of the body through. That leads to some obtuse problem solving. <laughs> like you really have to think outside of the box if you're going to get very far. But even still, it's not so overwhelmingly difficult that you're like, I don't know how I'm ever going to do this. If you really sit and think about it long enough and you think of the limitations that the game teaches that you that you have with the different body parts, you get to where you're, you get in the routine of it. I will say that swapping back and forth between the body parts, the controls are a little fickle. They're not... They're not anything particularly problematic because, or at least as far as I made it, I didn't run into anything that was timed or whatever. But it was, it was just that I would think I was connected with one body part because you press left bumper to, um, move between them. And sometimes you'll think you're highlighting one body part and you're actually on another. And it would be nice if maybe there was some kind of outline or something to indicate this is the fucking part you're holding. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, especially when you've got an odd combination of like one arm, one leg, and just a head, no body, and no other arm and leg. <laughs> and then you're like, I don't know which one's doing what right now. So it would take me a little longer to overcome some of the puzzles just because I couldn't figure out which part I was actually trying to manipulate or the part that I thought I was manipulating. I'd be like trying to throw an arm and then his head would go flying across the screen. I'd be like, well, fuck, got to do that again. Jesus. You know? <laughs> um, it's delightful. It's over the top. It's fantastic art style. It's definitely going to appeal to that. If I'm not mistaken, it's from the same devs as Manuel Samuel. Yes. Um, but I mentioned Flipping Death because it's got that very similar art style um, and and that same sense of humor. And so I I think if you're if you're fans of of either Manuel Samuel or Helheim, then Flipping Death is one you should check out, and vice versa. Um, I've spoke very very highly of Flipping Death. It's one of my favorite games, and I could mm-hmm. easily put Helheim up there with it as as you know, being that quirky, comedic, cartoonish level of enjoyable with that same puzzle platforming aesthetic. Well, then being 20 bucks, what is your verdict? I'm good. I'm good with going with a buy it on it. I had a good time. I do. Th- like I said, the only thing that I could really fuss about is the controls can be a little fickle and the the puzzles are very obtuse at times <laughs> and you can you can spend a little while stuck trying to figure out a puzzle but that's okay that's part of you know part of puzzle platforming and no you either get it or you get a guide <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right one final game to talk about tonight is called island saver fantasy island dlc developed by storm cloud games published by NatWest bank released august 12th on uh for island saver on all available platforms for 479 Suit up, Bionaut, and get ready for an awesome new adventure. The floating islands need your help. Save minotaurs, dragons, unicorns, and other mythological bankamoles. Use your money sense to help Rainbow Cat's smoothie business to get back up and running again. Cole, how is the DLC for Island Saver? This is incredible. (laughs) I love Island Saver because it's the kind of game that even though it's meant for kids, you can still mindlessly play it at 4 a.m. and be like, (laughs) this is such a good time. This is a good use of 4 a.m. time. Um, And that's that's not a negative. That's not meant negatively anyway at all. Um, I, I previously when I played it, I played the Dinosaur DLC. We fucking love dinosaurs in this house. And there's only one thing that we love 
comparable to dinosaurs in this house. And that's fucking unicorns. <laughs> so the fantasy DLC actually has unicorns. Yay. <gasps> and it's one of the first ones that you unlock, one of the first bankables that you unlock. So just like the base game, the whole premise is um, you need to save your money up, put it in the bank. I hope you remember what the fuck your passcode was because I took a couple tries. Uh, <laughs> you have to set a passcode for the bank to deposit your coins or to withdraw them out or to make purchases from the, the little in-game store, which is called Pigbees. And, um, which reminds me of Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> uh, but you, you have to remember that passcode. And if you set that shit back when you played the game when it first launched, you're in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's your actual bank pin. In that That's case. just it, because you don't actually set any numbers or anything. It's the face buttons. So oh, A, B, no. X, and Y. Yeah. Do you know how many combinations you can have out of A, B, X, and Y? A lot. <laughs> Holy fuck, I was there forever. <laughs> <laughs> I have made mistakes. <laughs> See, my pin would just be A, 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 A. If I were smart, that's what I would have done. And then you know what? I still probably would have forgot because it's been a while. <laughs> I, I didn't know I needed to put Island Saver in my password <laughs> manager. <laughs> <laughs> we're okay though we got through it we figured it out and i was able to <laughs> to to save my coins which is important because this game is made by a bank and it's made to teach kids the basics of you know saving with a little bit of environmentalism thrown in i'm totally on board with all of it because i'm bleeding heart liberal and i'm like this is great um there are some elements that are thrown in with the the fantasy DLC where you have this, what's essentially a Cheshire cat. Uh, they call him the Rainbow Cat because I guess Cheshire is probably Disney will get you for that shit. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. <laughs> um, but he he's the Rainbow Cat. He changes colors. He lays around. He likes to make smoothies. So you need to be able to like clean up areas so that you can plant fruit trees, um, watermelon plants and banana trees and strawberry plants. And um, your, your main goal is to clean up the whole, all there's four floating islands connected together with portals. Cause now you're thinking with portals, um, <laughs> You have to you have to clear an area, and then when you do it, it lets you access the portals to go to another island, which has a different. I love that the the different islands all had their own and unique look. With the other DLC and with the base levels for Island Saver, it just whatever theme that specific island was for, that was that right. Mm -hmm. But they just crammed four different biomes. <laughs> into the fantasy DLC and I'm like I'm 100% on board with this. All of the animals were were creative. They were um imps instead of monkeys. There were um minotaurs. There was the unicorn, there's the dragon, and they have you can you can actually just like any other DLCs in the base game, there's two of them that you can actually tame to ride. This case, you get to dry, ride the unicorn and the dragon. <laughs> That's super fucking cool. I will say, however, though, that the controls for the dragon are a little on the iffy side because you have to use it to to glide over longer distances, which is fine, except for you have to hold down the A button for the duration of the glide or you just drop. Mm. Um. We all know I bitch about anything that requires me to hold one single button for a long period of time. So this is just a standard gripe on my end. This is an accessibility thing. Um, it would be a lot easier if I could just toggle it on or off. Uh, most people aren't going to have a problem with that. That's all on me. And I'm very aware of that. But I do need to mention it. If that's an issue for you, you can hand fatigue, hold the button. Eh, you're stuck. Um, I did not think to check because you you have the dragon for such a short amount of time that i didn't think to check if it was toggle could be toggled in the in the um options 
I would be surprised, though. That's not something they typically include in the options for this game. It's not a lot of accessibility issues, but then again, for the most part, there's not a lot of need for accessibility issues. Um, but that is, that was really my only major complaint was like, I would just gradually fall out of the sky because <laughs> my hand would get tired and I couldn't hold the button anymore. <laughs> um, the animation for the dragon when you're riding it and you're running instead of just flying, that's a little disorienting as well because like you see the, the front claws and stuff come up as it runs and you're like, that is a wonky ass animation and I can't quite put my finger on why it bugs me. But there's something about that whole animation that just doesn't sit right. No. Um, but it's not something that, that like distracts you so much from the game that you can't enjoy the DLC. Uh, they did add achievements for this DLC. So go get you some more achievements. One thing, though, is that they also added achievements that weren't previously there for the dinosaur DLC. Oh. So I actually need to go reload my island. I don't know if they'll pop retroactively or if I have to go do that shit again. <laughs> Guess we'll find out. Yeah. And I was I was focused when I was playing on on testing out and trying to break the <laughs> the fantasy island. But um oh I I got sidetracked on the biomes. Um there are four. There is a lava biome. There is the forest biome, there's the frozen biome, and then there's just your standard issue island. Um, but I did think it was neat that, apart from all the other islands where they just had the one aesthetic, it was like, no, let's just fit all the different fantasy lands right here, right here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought it was, it was really well done. Island Saver for being a whole thing for kids from a bank is like super chill time. And I can't find any reason to ever be mad at it. Yeah. And even better, the fact that the DLC is five bucks, all of the profit from that money is going to charity. Like yeah. Nat West bank is not getting any profits from this. Yeah. And it teaches kids good lessons about, yeah. you know, uh, you know, cleaning up after themselves and not littering it just like in the base game the litter bugs will come out and try to mess things up for you and uh so there is a little bit of combat in that regard you got to use your water to squirt them i think it's pretty mundane as far as combat goes it's totally suitable for smaller kids and uh i think it's i think it's great all right then five bucks your verdict yeah to buy it all right. And if you don't have the dinosaur DLC, I don't know what the fuck you're doing. You should buy that one, too. <laughs> I know I reviewed it already, but just a friendly reminder, fucking get them both. I love how vulgar you get during kids' game reviews. I know. <laughs> I can't wait to do that educational game for kids soon. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, Jesus. That's going to be... What, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Well, that is it for this episode. Cole, thank you for being here at the end to help wrap it up. Uh, yep. Thanks. Thanks to Chris, Purnell and Tim for being there for the party cast, even though Purnell went like 25 minutes on one review again. <laughs> That's what happens when you're not around Cole. No one's there to, yeah. to rein him in. I thought I thought I just made his rants worse. Eh, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just know. I just sent him off on different tangents as yes. all. <laughs> Nah, boy. You got any final words to end the show? Uh, don't be afraid to take a mental health break. That's good advice. Good advice. Mm -hmm.